Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to another episode of our exciting and fascinating series towards understanding Surah Yusuf. I am your host Yasir Qadi. In our last episode we were talking about the interpretation of the dream of the king and the fact that Yusuf alayhi salam gave them this interpretation and this news now reaches the king back. Today's episode inshallah ta'ala will take up the story from the king finding out who is Yusuf and what is the story of Yusuf. Stay with us. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدَى وَهُدًى وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. We were talking about the dream of the king that had been interpreted by the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. If you remember, the king had seen seven fat, healthy cows being eaten by seven thin cows. And he had seen seven grains of corn that were ripe and luscious and basically producing a lot of grain and seven of them that were withered away and dry. And Yusuf alayhi salam understood immediately what the dream meant and he interpreted automatically and he gave them also not just the interpretation, he told them what to do to solve the problem. And the problem was that there would have been seven years of drought after seven years of basically luscious produce, there would have been seven years of famine. So Yusuf alayhi salam told them, for seven years you will produce as you are customarily used to producing, make sure you save all of it except for a little, illa qalilan, that you're going to have to eat. And then there will come seven years of difficulty and they will eat up the seven years of produce that happened. I want to talk a little bit about dreams and dream interpretation because dreams is a constant theme of Surah Yusuf. We, the surah starts with a dream and we see the dream of the people in the prison, uh, we see the dream of the king himself and then the end of the surah we see the conclusion and the interpretation of the dream of Yusuf alayhi salam. As we said, dreams are of three types. One of them is the dream that yourself imagines, your soul imagines. Another is from shaitan. And the ministers accused the, the king of seeing one of these types of dreams. You are seeing jumbled up, messed up uh, nightmares from shaitan. And the third type we call it ru'ya, which means from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I want to clarify in, in, in a few minutes is that the concept of dream interpretation Dream interpretation is a blessing that Allah gives to His chosen servants. People are blessed with this knowledge. It is not something that you can look up in an encyclopedia or a book. It is very common to find books in the marketplace that say how to interpret dreams or the dictionary of dreams. And there is a famous fabricated book that is attributed to a great scholar by the name of uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin. And they say this is the dictionary of interpretations of dreams by Muhammad ibn Sirin. This book is in fact a fabrication. Muhammad ibn Sirin was a great scholar. He was a student of Abu Huraira. And he was a dream interpreter, but he never wrote a book. Actually, a charlatan, a fakester, a trickster, many centuries later, wanted to make money by selling this book. So he put dream interpretation by Ibn Sirin. And it wasn't by Ibn Sirin. He just wanted to mass produce this book to get some income and some fame from it. The reality is that this book and all books in fact that claim to tell you how to interpret dreams, these books are not authentic. You do not learn how to interpret dreams. Actually, this is a science that Allah blesses you with. Now, I am not denying that there are some hadith and some indications that you can get from uh, the Quran and the Sunnah of how to interpret dreams. For example, a fat cow might signify uh, a fruitful year. But what I'm trying to stress here, yes, there are a few such things that we find in the Quran and Sunnah. But what I'm trying to stress here, Overall, the science of dream interpretation is a symbolic science that Allah blesses people with. And it is relative, the dream and the interpretation of the dream is relative to the person who saw it and the culture that he or she is living in. So for example, to see a certain animal living in one part of the world might signify one thing. To see the same animal, another person in another part of the world sees it, it might signify something totally different. Because the symbolism will be related to the culture you're living in. Similarly, 
the same symbol might mean something different in one century than it does in another century. So the very concept of having a book of dream interpretations doesn't make any sense. Rather, as we said, dream interpretation is a science that Allah Azza wa Jal blesses the chosen people with. How does a person get this knowledge? By being pious and righteous. As simple as that. This is one of the very few sciences in Islam that is not an academic science. You don't study it. The majority of sciences in Islam can be studied. We study fiqh, we study Quran, we study hadith. But dream interpretation, we can only study a little bit of it, very little bit of it. You would not be able to write a large volume on dream interpretation. Rather, this is a blessing from Allah. So I advise my viewers to beware and be cautious, not just of the books that are on the marketplace, but also of those people who think that they can interpret dreams and you find them all the time coming. Many times you find them on satellite channels or you find them sometimes uh, uh, you can call them up and they'll ask you for some money or you go to them and they'll ask you for some money and they pretend to interpret dreams. Be careful. I'm not saying all of them are false. Allah knows best. But for sure, many of these people are just trying to make a business out of it by milking your money out. So remember, Dream interpretation is a blessing from Allah. If you do see an interesting dream that you want to get interpreted, find out from the people of your village, of your town, of your city, who are the righteous and pious people. And only tell the righteous and pious people of your dreams. Do not announce it in public because the Prophet ﷺ clearly told us that when you see a good dream, only tell it to the people whom you trust, whom you confide in. So go to the local, pious, God-fearing ulama of your locality and confide to them and ask them uh, what is the interpretation of the dream. So, inshallah ta'ala, then you will get the dream interpreted properly. Returning to our story, Yusuf alayhi salam tells them the interpretation of the dream and he also informs them what to do to prevent this famine and drought from killing off large po populations within Egypt. He says, save the grain and eat it up in the next seven years. So, when the messenger returned to the palace, and he informed them of what this dream meant. Obviously, the king asked him. Now, the Qur'an doesn't say this, but it's understood from the context. And this is the beauty of the Qur'an, that these details which are not needed, but are understood, are not mentioned. So the king asked him, where did you get this interpretation from? Obviously, you didn't know it, because if you knew it, you wouldn't have had to leave. Remember, the, 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 the messenger asked for permission, Arsiluni, send me away. Had he had the knowledge himself, he would have told the dream right then and there. The fact that he needs to go away and then he comes back and he tells them this is what the dream means. Therefore the king understood that you didn't get this yourself, you must have gotten it for somebody. So he asked him, where did you get it from? The messenger said, there was this person in prison, in jail. He was the one who told me of the dream. So the king said, bring him to me. I want to speak to him directly. قَالَ الْمَلِكُ أُتُونِي بِهِ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُ الرَّسُولِ The messenger comes from the king. Not the same person. Now the king's guards are coming. Now an elite force is coming. To say, come out of jail, the king is calling you. Come now out of this prison. You have been locked up for almost a decade. And now you're going to be released, not just to any house. We're going to take you straight to the palace of the king. So the messengers, the elite guard come to release Yusuf from the prison. Lo and behold, what does he say? He says, قَالَ ارْجِعْ إِلَى Rabbik. Go back to the king. After having remained in prison for so long, he says, go back to the king. فَاسْأَلْهُ مَا بَالُ النِّسْوَةِ اللَّاتِي قَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنْ What is the matter? What is the affair? What is the secret of those women who cut their hands? All of those women who had cut their hands, he must have now mentioned all of them. And, and he said, go ask the king to find out from them what is the real state of affairs. Now realize, the king has never heard of Yusuf. He's never heard of this affair. He's never heard of this, this fiasco or scandal. Or, or if he has, he's only heard of it vaguely. It hasn't reached him. Now Yusuf, if he wanted to, he could have gone to the king and ignored the whole fiasco. Ignored the entire episode. Take it as a chapter of history that doesn't want to be talked about. But no, his honor is at stake. People might still be doubting what actually happened. Who seduced whom? Was there an actual act of, of evil that took place? So Yusuf alayhi salam wants to clear his honor, even if it means he has to remain in prison for a longer period of time. So he said, go back to your king and verify what happened with regards to those women. Inna rabbi bikaydihinna alim. My Lord is well aware of their plot, of their planning. 
Now, notice here, he doesn't mention the wife of Aziz specifically, even though she was the instigator of the plot, even though she is the main culprit. He doesn't mention her, he mentions the whole group of women. Why does he do so? He probably does so, so, that, so as not to pinpoint the guilty culprit directly, but rather to give the group of people, all of them. And he mentions that all of them plotted against him, even though it was primarily the wife of Aziz who plotted against him. So he refused to go out of the prison. And once again, our Prophet ﷺ remarked, and this hadith is a Sahih Muslim, and in other books of hadith, he said, Ajibtu, I am amazed and astonished at how patient my brother Yusuf was. The Prophet ﷺ calls him my brother because all of the Prophets are brothers, meaning that all of them uh, they share the same message. Not that they are blood brothers, but that they are brothers of the same religion. So he says, I am amazed at the patience of my brother Yusuf. Had the messenger come for me, had the king's messengers come for me, I would have rushed to the door. I would have raced to come out. And every one of us would have done the same. Every one of us would have tried to rush to go out and be released. After having remained seven, eight, nine, ten years in jail, what would be our fate? But Yusuf salam said, no, go back to the king and find out what was the actual story of those women who cut their hands. Verily, my Lord is well aware of what they had done. So now the messenger comes back and he says, Yusuf has refused to go out of jail. What prisoner in his right mind will refuse to go out of jail? What prisoner will tell the, 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 any messenger, I don't want to leave prison? Yusuf salam said that, I don't want to leave prison until my name is cleared. I am not going to leave this place until my name and my honor is completely exonerated and everybody knows I had nothing to do with any sin and crime. So the king is absolutely astonished. The king is amazed. What type of prisoner is this? And he calls all of these ladies and he asks them, Ma khatbukunna? What was the matter? What is the story? Tell me. When you tried to seduce Yusuf, did anything happen? Now, remember, and this is very amazing. The wife of Aziz publicly announced, I am trying to seduce him. It's not a matter that she's trying to hide it. She publicly says, I was the one who tried to seduce him. But still, Yusuf wants to make sure that there's no ambiguity. Nobody thinks anything actually happened. It's not even that he has been accused of a crime. It's just that he wants to make sure that there is no trace of doubt in anybody's mind. So the king calls all of the ladies who were present there, all of the ladies who had cut their hands, and he asks them, tell me what actually happened. Their initial response, قُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ They said, we seek Allah's refuge, all praise is due to Allah. مَا عَلِمْنَا عَلَيْهِ مِنْ سُوء We know of no evil from him. So this was their initial response to get out of this accusation. We need to take a short break. As soon as we come back, we'll continue the story. I know you'll stay with us. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةُ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةُ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. Welcome back. So the king had called all of these ladies, and he asked them what was the matter, what actually happened when you tried to seduce Yusuf. And notice here the, the, the beauty of, of Yusuf's action. The women have admitted to trying to seduce him. It's not as if they accused him of any crime. So the king himself says, when you try to seduce Yusuf, he doesn't say who seduced whom. He knows, everybody knows the story. But he wants to know what happened. Was there any ambiguity? Did any type of fahish or evil actually occur? Was there any sign from Yusuf that he was tempted by you? So it's not that Yusuf was trying to prove that he didn't seduce. Yusuf is trying to prove his ultimate innocence. I wasn't even tempted. I was absolutely pure. Look at the character of this man. It was not even that he was charged with a crime. 
What man could have refused if a man had fallen, to, had fallen into this temptation? Who would have blamed this man? But it wasn't even that. He wanted to make sure that everybody knew that his character was absolutely and 100% clean, that there was nothing wrong that he had done. So the initial response of all of these ladies, they said, "Ma alimna alihi min su." We don't know any evil coming from him. So they're saying, look now, they're not saying we are innocent. Look now, even they admit that they're guilty. Look at how they phrase it. They phrase it by saying, we don't know of any evil coming from him. We didn't see anything wrong from his side. They didn't say, we see no wrong from our side. They were guilty. They were evil. مَا عَلِمْنَا عَلِيهِ مِنْ سُوءٍ So all of them say, they testify to the character of Yusuf. And they say, we don't find any evil from him. But at this stage, and now here, many historians say that the, the minister, Al-Aziz himself, had passed away in this time. So the minister had now died, and so the wife of the minister now is a widow. She is now without a husband. This is, uh, uh, as I said, one interpretation. And here, of course, I mean, just a, a, a side point or a tangent. We have to realize that the details of the stories of the Qur'an that we obtain from sources outside the Qur'an we have to be a little bit more careful about them. These details, we call them in Arabic, Israeliyat, or stories that we get from Jewish and Christian narratives. Israeliyat, and we have to mention this because we, we've been talking quite a lot about other details. Israeliyat, or these extra Quranic interpretations, extra Quranic details, it is permissible to narrate them. But we have to realize that their source might not be true. If this narrative contradicts the Quran and Sunnah, we have to reject it. If the narrative supports the Quran and Sunnah, then of course the Quran and Sunnah is sufficient for us. But if the narrative fills in the blanks, gives us details that neither contradicts nor goes against. In this case, we may narrate it, but we may also have to make sure that we realize that this is from the Israeliyat. For example, the name of the wife of the minister, it is not found in the Quran and Sunnah. We find it in Jewish and Christian sources that her name was uh, Uzlikhia or Zulaikha. This is a name that is not found in the Quran and Sunnah. Can we use this name? Well, if we use it, if we use it, we have to realize that this is a name that we don't know for sure. It is found in other sources, it is not found in our source. On the other hand, we find certain things that are absolutely false in Jewish and Christian sources that goes against the Quranic version. For example, in the Jewish and Christian version, we find that uh, Yusuf salam actually did something that was not absolutely right to do. Or he ended up marrying Zulaikha. And this is a common myth that many Muslims have taken and it is not found in the Quran and Sunnah. And in fact, it would go against the perfection of the character of a Prophet of Allah to marry a woman who had such character that is not appropriate to have. So this is something that actually goes against our version and we need to reject it. And also a point in mind, the story of, of Yusuf and the wife of, of Aziz, the Quranic version is one thing. And then we find later storytellers have embellished it and have given details and have made it into a love story. And it was not a love story. Yusuf alayhi salam did not end up marrying the wife of Aziz. This is not found in any Islamic uh, version or text and this is not something that is appropriate for a prophet. And yet we find many of the storytellers have embellished the story and made it into a love story and this is not something we need to avoid. The Quran is quite clear about what happened and we should stick with the Quranic version. Returning to the story, once the women have exonerated Yusuf and they have said there's nothing wrong with Yusuf, he was innocent. Now, قالت امرأة العزيز Now the wife of Aziz says الآن حص حص الحق Now the truth is حص 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 means manifest, clear Now the truth must be said أنا راوته عن نفسه I was the one who tried to seduce him and verily إنه لمن الصادقين He is of those who is completely honest and true إِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ He is of those who is completely true, completely honest. He has no sin done upon him. He has no evil character. ذَلِكَ لِيَعْلَمَ أَنِّي لَمْ أَخُنْهُ بِالْغَيْبِ I say this so that he may know that I never betrayed his trust and that Allah does not guide those who 
uh, betray themselves. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي And I am not fully saying that I am completely innocent. I'm not saying this. Verily, إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُوءٍ Verily, all souls have this innate inclination to do evil, except for those whom my Lord has shown mercy. Verily, my Lord is forgiving and merciful. Now these two verses, verse 52 and 53, have been the source of a lot of interpretation. A lot of, of speech between the scholars, who said it and what does it actually mean. But to summarize, the question arises, who said verse 52 and 53? Well, if you look at the context of the surah, the context of this, this, this verse, the first thing that comes to mind is that the wife of Aziz is the one who is speaking. So the wife of Aziz says, I say this, say what? I say this, that I was the one who seduced him. I say it so that he may know, my husband or my ex-husband, meaning he has died, so that he may know or that it may be known that I wasn't dishonest to him. In other words, I never actually committed the act. So she admits, I tried to seduce him, but it didn't happen. So in the end of the day, I didn't actually betray the bed of my husband, even though I committed the crime of trying to seduce Yusuf and trying to do the act, still it never happened. So let everybody know that in the end of the day, I actually did not commit the crime. So I want to say this publicly and I want to make the, the air clear that I was guilty of seducing him but I was not guilty of committing the act of intercourse. This is what you're trying to say. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِكَ الْخَائِنِينَ And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide the plots of those who are evil and dishonest. And then to make sure that everybody understands she is saying وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي I'm not saying that I'm innocent. I know I'm guilty. I know I'm guilty of what? I'm guilty of trying to seduce him. So she's saying, don't think I'm trying to be pious. Don't think that I'm trying to say that, oh, I have not committed any sin. I know that I have committed the sin. And the sin that I've committed is the sin of seduction and not the sin of actual fornication. And then she makes a little excuse for himself. Inna nafsa la ammaratun bisu. Verily, the souls, they are inclined to evil. And as we said, especially the evil of lust, especially the evil of being attracted to the opposite gender and acting upon that attraction, this is a lust that every single human being has. And the men have it to a level more than women do, even though in this case we find the women have it more than the man does. And this is the whole beauty of the story of Yusuf, that Yusuf, despite the fact that he is a young man, is able to fight that temptation. And it is the married women around him who fall prey to this temptation. So she makes an excuse and she says verily souls are inclined towards evil illa ma rahima rabbi except for those whom my lord has shown mercy there are a few who are above falling into this sin verily my lord is forgiving and merciful i hope for forgiveness from my lord even though she does not believe in allah she still believes in her gods and she expects her gods to forgive her for this sin this is the first interpretation of the verse the second interpretation and this is a bit more difficult to understand, is that it is not the wife of Aziz who is speaking, rather it is Yusuf speaking now. It is Yusuf speaking, not the wife of Aziz. The Yus it is Yusuf who says, This I have done, meaning I have refused to go out of prison. I have refused to answer the king. And I wanted the king to question the women. Why? So that he may know that I was honest. Who is the he? Once again, we have interpretations. One group of scholars says that he is my master. So that my master may know, may know that I never did the crime. I was innocent. And the other interpretation, so that he may know, i.e. my Lord may know, Allah Azza wa may know, that I was honest and truthful to him. But to be, to be honest here, this second interpretation seems a bit far-fetched. The second interpretation requires a little bit of changing of the context. And also... Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal knows everything. Allah Azza wa Jal does not need to be shown this through the king's tactics of, of calling the, uh, the women. So this is not something that makes sense. Uh, also the fact that uh, Yusuf alayhi salam is supposed to have said, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي That I am not saying I am totally innocent. The scholars say what Yusuf was trying to say, 
I had the inclination as well, but I controlled it. And he makes an excuse for saying, Verily, souls are inclined towards evil, except for those, the souls that my Lord has shown mercy on. The interpretation that Yusuf was the one speaking here, it requires a little bit of imagination. And in fact, it goes against the context of the verse. So even though linguistically it might be possible, the reality is that the first meaning that comes to mind, and inshallah ta'ala the correct one, the one who was doing the speaking throughout all of these verses is the wife of Aziz. Now, here uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says that this woman said, Inna nafsa la ammaratun bisu, that verily uh, the, the souls are inclined towards evil. How many types of souls are there? There are a number of types of souls. There is the soul that is inclined towards evil. And then there is the uh, nafs, uh, the, that is al-mutma'inna, or the pious one. And then there is the nafs that is al-lawama, or the one that is in between. And this is one interpretation of the ulama, that there are three types of souls. The pious soul, the nafs al-mutma'inna, the evil soul, the ammara bisu, and then the soul that is in the middle, nafs al-lawama. And there are other interpretations as well. This leads us to the conclusion of today's episode. Insha'Allah ta'ala in our next episode, we will continue talking about the story of Yusuf and what happened between Yusuf and the king. Join us then. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة. لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. ما كان حديثا يفترى ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون